Hi, Stephen King here, and I'm going to read to you from my new book, from the start of my new book. That way I don't have to explain anything that goes before. And uh, it's called Billy Summers, and it's out on August 3rd. Billy Summers sits in the hotel lobby waiting for his ride. It's Friday noon. Although he's reading a digest-sized comic book called Archie's Pals and Gals, he's thinking about Emil Zola and Zola's third novel, his breakthrough, Therese Rakim. He's thinking it's very much a young man's book. He's thinking that Zola was just beginning to mine what would turn out to be a deep and fabulous vein of ore. He's thinking that Zola was, is, the nightmare version of Charles Dickens. He's thinking that might be a good thesis for an essay, not that he's ever written one. At two minutes past 12, the door opens and two men come into the lobby. One is tall with black hair combed in a 50s pompadour. The other is short and bespectacled. Both are wearing suits. All of Nick's men wear suits. Billy knows the tall one from out west. He's been with Nick for a long time. His name is Frank McIntosh. Because of the pomp, some of Nick's men call him Frankie Elvis, or now that he has a tiny bald spot in back, Solar Elvis, but not to his face. Billy doesn't know the other one. He must be local. McIntosh holds out his hand. Billy rises and shakes it. Hey, Billy, been a while. Good to see you. Good to see you too, Frank. This is Polly Logan. Hi, Polly. Billy shakes with a short one. Pleased to meet you, Billy. McIntosh takes the Archie Digest from Billy's hand. Still reading the comics, huh? Yeah, Billy says, yeah, yeah I, I like them quite a bit. The funny ones, sometimes the superheroes, but I don't like them as much. McIntosh breezes through the pages and shows something to Polly Logan. Look at these chicks. Man, I could jack off to these. Betty and Veronica, Billy says, taking the comic back. Veronica is Archie's girlfriend, and Betty wants to be. You read books too, Logan asks. Some, if I'm going on a long trip, and magazines, but mostly comic books. Good, good, Logan says, and drops McIntosh a wink. Not very subtle, and McIntosh frowns, but Billy's okay with it. You ready to take a ride, McIntosh asks. Sure, Billy tucks his digest into his back pocket. Archie and his bosomy gal pals. There's an essay waiting to be written there, too, about the comfort of haircuts and attitudes that don't change, about Riverdale and how time stands still there. And let's go, McIntosh says. Nick's waiting. McIntosh drives. Logan says he'll sit in back because he's short. Billy expects them to go west because that's where the fancy part of this town is, and Nick Majerian likes to live large, whether home or away, and he doesn't do hotels. But they go northeast instead. Two miles from downtown, they enter a neighborhood that looks lower middle class to Billy, three or four steps better than the trailer park he grew up in, but far from fancy. No big gated houses, not here. This is a neighborhood of ranch homes with lawn sprinklers twirling on small patches of grass. Most are one story. Most are well men maintained, but a few need paint and there's a crabgrass taking over some of the lawns. He sees one house with a piece of cardboard blocking a broken window. In front of another, a fat man in Bermuda shorts and a wife beater sits in a long chair from Costco or Sam's Club drinking a beer and watching them go by. Times have been good in America for a while now, but maybe that's going to change. Billy knows neighborhoods like this. They are a barometer, and this one has started to go down. The people who live here are working the kind of jobs where you punch a clock. McIntosh pulls into the driveway of a two-story with a patchy lawn. It's painted a subdued yellow. It's okay, but doesn't look like a place Nick Majerian would choose to live, even for a few days. It looks like the kind of place a machinist or a lower echelon airport employee would live with his coupon clipping wife and two kids making mortgage payments every month and bowling in a, in a beer league on Thursday nights. Logan opens Billy's door. 
Billy puts his Archie Digest on the dashboard and gets out. McIntosh leads the way up the front porch steps. It's hot outside, but inside it's air conditioned. Nick Majerian stands in the short hallway leading down to the kitchen. He's wearing a suit that probably cost as much as a monthly mortgage payment on this house. His thinning hair is combed flat, no pompadour for him. His face is round and Vegas tan. He's heavy set, but when he pulls Billy into a hug, that protruding belly feels as hard as a stone. Billy! Nick exclaims and kisses him on both cheeks. Big, hearty smacks. He's wearing a million dollar grin. Billy, Billy man, it's good to see you. Good to see you too, Nick. He looks around. You usually stay someplace fancier than this. He pauses, if you don't mind me saying. Nick laughs. He has a beautiful, infectious laugh to go with the grin. McIntosh joins in and Logan smiles. I got a place over on the west side, short term, house sitting, you could call it. There's a fountain in the front yard. Got a naked little kid in the middle of it. There's, there's a word for that. Cherub, Billy thinks, but doesn't say. He just keeps smiling. Anyway, a little kid peeing in the water. You'll see it, you'll see it. No, this one isn't mine, Billy. This one's yours, if you decide to take the job, that is. Nick shows him around. Fully furnished, he says, like he's selling it. Maybe he sort of is. This one has a second floor where there are three bedrooms and two bathrooms, the second small, probably for the kids. On the first floor, there's a kitchen, a living room, and a dining room that's so small it's actually a dining nook. Most of the cellar has been converted into a long carpeted room with a big TV at one end and a ping pong table at the other. Track lighting. Nick calls it the rumpus room, and this is where they sit. McIntosh asks if they would like something to drink. He says the soda, beer, lemonade, and iced tea. I want an Arnold Palmer, Nick says, half and half, lots of ice. Billy says that sounds good. They make small talk until the drinks come. The weather, how hot it is down here in the border south. Nick wants to know how Billy's trip in was. Billy says it was fine, but doesn't say where he flew in from, and Nick doesn't ask. Nick asks, how about them fucking Trump? And Billy says, yeah, how about him? That's about all they've got, but it's okay because by then McIntosh is back with two tall glasses on a tray, and once he leaves, Nick gets down to business. When I called your man Bucky, he tells me you're hoping to retire. I'm thinking about it. Been at it a long time, too long. Truth, how old are you anyway? 44, been doing this ever since you took off the uniform? Pretty much, he's pretty sure Nick knows all this. How many in all? Billy shrugs, I don't exactly remember. It's 17, 18 counting the first one. Bucky says, you might do one more if the price was right. He waits for Billy to ask. Billy doesn't, so Nick resumes. The price on this one is very, very right. You could do it and spend the rest of your life someplace warm, drinking pina coladas in a hammock. He busts out the big grin again. Two million, 500,000 up front, the rest after. Billy's whistle isn't part of the act which he doesn't think of as an act, but his dumb self, the one he shows to guys like Nick and Frank and Polly. It's like a seatbelt. You don't use it because you expect to be in a crash, but you never know who you might meet coming over the hill on the wrong side of the road. This is also true on the road of life, where people veer all over the place and drive the wrong way on the turnpike. Why so much? The most he's ever gotten on a contract was 70K. It's not a politician, is it? Because I don't do that. Not even close. Is it a bad person? Nick laughs, shakes his head, and looks at Billy with real affection. Always the same question with you. Billy nods. The dumb self might be a shuck, but this is true. He only does bad people. It's how he sleeps at night. It goes without saying that he has made a living working for bad people, yes, but Billy doesn't see this as a moral conundrum. He has no problem with bad people paying to have other bad people killed. He basically sees himself as a garbage man with a gun. Thanks a lot.